Welcome to our video on wood decking. We talked about some of the issues having to do with wood in chapter 4 on materials. This is chapter 6 on beams, section 2, subsection 1 on wood decking, and um, this might more appropriately be um, described as sizing wood decking, but a lot of what we do with decking is more in a prescriptive mode. So we're just going to call this wood decking, which we've dealt with in, in the previous chapter under um, materials. In this case, though, we're going to focus a little bit more on sizing and uh, allowed spans for various types of wood decking. The most common kind of decking we can have is plywood. Um, this is a classic material that we use for short spans between supporting beams. So in roofing applications, we'll use half inch thick plywood. And the most common space for that between the roof rafters or the, the supporting trusses is 24 inches on center. Um, we can go less than that, particularly in a location where there might be very high snow loads and we might want to have more structure in the roof. But in almost all parts of the United States, half inch thick plywood will span 24 inches in roofing applications, particularly any kind of a sloped roof. For floors, um, where deflection is a more, more of a concern, people's perception of movement is a concern, we'll tend to use thicker um, decking. So we'll use three quarter inch thick tongue and groove plywood or we may use 5 8 inch thick particle board on top of half inch thick plywood. In this case, the half inch thick plywood is what's actually taking the bending moment. The 5 8 inch thick particle board is taking the local force associated with very localized forces like the heel of a high heel shoe. Um, the particle board also damps sound and provides a very smooth surface um, to support carpet or whatever other uh, material we might want to put on it. The most common spacing for the support beams under the floor decking is 16 inches on center, but either the 3 quarter inch thick tongue and groove plywood or the 5 8 inch thick particle board on top of half inch thick plywood can span up to 24 inches between floor beams. Again, though, the customary spacing is 16 inches on center. This is a, a view of plywood, which we've talked about before. Uh, here we have a layer with grain going this way. On each side of that are layers with grain going that way. And then the outside has grain going vertically again. Um, this is 3 quarter inch uh, plywood. Its actual dimension is more on the order of 23 30 seconds, which actually would be 24 30 seconds if it was truly three quarters of an inch. But we see in every industry a belief that somehow by shaving down small amounts, they're going to make huge amounts of money. Um, so this qualifies as nominal three quarter inch, even though it's 23, 30 seconds of an inch thick. Um, this would come in four by eight sheets. It would have a tongue and groove pattern routed on the edges. Um, and that would be the means by itself for spanning the uh, 16 inches or 24 inches between floor joists. Floor decking is typically supported either with solid sawn wood beams, and this is an example here, although this is a bit small. This is a 2x4, but basically it comes in 2x6, 2x8, 2x10, and 2x12. And this is the sort of common com combination. So with these 2x every 16 inches on center, we're able to get a pretty efficient floor structure and then the plywood decking is able to easily span between those. The other kind of support we might have are wood eye joist. Uh, and here are a couple of examples. Uh, this one with uh, solid sawn um, flanges top and bottom. These flanges can be very long because they can be finger jointed and effectively uh, achieve the full strength of the material. 
and this is oriented strand board for the web which is pretty resistive to shear um, which is what allows it to be as thin as it is. So here we have one kind of eye joist here we have another and these eye joists by the way can be bought in lengths at least 60 feet long possibly longer than that they can be shipped to the site at those lengths and then cut to length on the site so um, it's a pretty efficient way to do things in that you start cutting whatever lengths you want out of that long piece and by properly properly patterning things there's very little waste okay so as designers we do not size this kind of decking we just specify it in other words all the testing has been done and it is a certified approach to uh, constructing a floor and we don't need to do any kind of calculations for the plywood unless of course we have some kind of application where the floor loads are extremely high or for some reason we decide we want to span more than 24 inches but normally for most kinds of construction we just specify two buys of an appropriate depth every 16 inches on center and then we span between them with the decking so when we want to span a little further, this is the most common material that we use. This is uh, laminated uh, decking, laminated wood decking. Um, these are one buys right here, there, and there. We call them one buys. They uh, used to come one inch thick. Uh, they were sawn one inch thick. Then they would shrink from curing, and then they get smaller when they were planed down. Um, again though the industry has learned that they don't have to cut it to exactly one inch uh, they know exactly how thick to cut it in order to minimize waste and furthermore this dimension right here is not fully three quarters of an inch thick that one right there is almost three quarters these are slightly less because these surfaces get planed again because this is material that's considered visual grade wood in other words, you don't cover this up like you would two buys and plywood. You would uh, clean them up by by putting a ceiling in a sheetrock or something like that. In this case, you should be able to look up at the ceiling and see this material and have, have it be very visually acceptable. Uh, here are some examples. This is two layer, three layer, four layer, and five layer. This is called nominal three inch decking. Um, we used to cut two by eights and we'd plane them down. They'd end up being two and a half. By the time we get rid of, done with all the processing here, these are two and three sixteenths of an inch thick, but we still call that a nominal three inch. And by the way, this is probably better, even though it's thinner, it's probably better in many ways than the old, uh, two by three by eights that got planed down to two and a half inches they would have knots for example that penetrate all the way through the material in this case we might have a knot in the centerpiece um, but there would not be a knot at a corresponding point on either surface so we're drastically improving it in terms of uh, the impact of knots but we can also uh, put a superior grade of material on the top and bottom which makes this a better flooring uh, material than the classic uh, solid sawn lumber that we would plane down to two and a half inches. The other huge advantage to this is these thinner pieces of wood can cure without splitting and, uh, and it was very difficult with thicker pieces of wood to complete the curing process without the material becoming damage because it would split itself during the curing process. So as I mentioned, these are visual grade. Um, this is visual grade decking. It's uh, typically used with other visually graded materials. So here we have glue lamb uh, frames and basically all the wood here is exposed and there's no need for any finishing other than to varnish it. Now, um, these de this decking presents some interesting challenges. Um, 
decking because as a beam it's very wide and fairly shallow. It's almost always governed by deflection. And in order to reduce deflection, we would like to have continuity over intermediate supports. Um, but this material only comes in certain lengths, so it's often tempting to just run the material from one support line to the next and stop it there. So this would be an example of a one span or a single span application of the material. When we use it in that mode, it's going to tend to deflect a fair amount. And so that limits the spans that we can go for. If we can do something called random length continuous by staggering out these joints, and from a shear point of view, we'd like to not have one of these uh, within two feet of the support. But also, if we want to get stiffness and continuity across the support, we don't want this connection point to be too close to that line. So random length continuous configurations give a, gives us effectively continuity over these supports and as a consequence it's a relatively stiffer decking. So one of the things you have to keep in mind is you will read the specifications that tell you how to achieve adequate randomness or what kind of patterns that you can get away with and you not only need to specify those but you need to make sure that your builder understands it and then you might even want to make site visits during the construction process because often people in the field don't understand this concept and you won't get a very good product you might get too much deflection in the roof or you might get some splitting if the joints don't occur in the right locations so this is one of the issues that you have to keep track of. So there are specifications for how to get this random length continuous behavior. Another issue of importance is this idea of diaphragm construction. Um, we would like to have every roof act in a diaphragm mode. It's almost always beneficial. Unfortunately, when you have many, many of these pieces that can slide relative to each other, um, you may not get very good diaphragm action, but you can uh, come up with an appropriate nailing schedule. So you'll notice these right here are examples of toenails, which are uh, set at an angle and they're designed to connect these two boards together. So that toenail would come through the connection between these two things or through that interface and will embed it. It gets nailed into this piece and then embedded into that one. This can be used to get effective diaphragm action out of the roof. Actually, a somewhat more common way to do it is to simply apply another layer of roofing, which would be half inch oriented strand board, which gets nailed down really carefully in order to assure good diaphragm action. Um, oriented strand board is pretty inexpensive and it does enhance the performance of the system and tends to be a little more reliable because you don't have to worry about the skill of the people who are putting these nails in. Uh, this is not inherently a very well insulated roof. Uh, wood is certainly less of a thermal bridge than steel or something or other metals or even much less even than concrete but it's still not a very good insulator. So some kind of insulation needs to go on the top of that. And then there's typically a recovery board or something that will allow people to walk on the roof without damaging the insulation. And then there's a built up roofing membrane to achieve the waterproofing. And the combination of this insulation and the, and the recovery board and the membrane, um, which is an additional load or burden on this decking, is typically on the order of or less than four pounds a square foot. So when we go to look at the spanning capacity of this material or the load capacity, we have to account for the superimposed load of four pounds a square foot. We also have to account for the weight of the decking itself. And uh, we're gonna look at three inch nominal. I happen to like it because it it's better than two inch in that this doesn't give you a proper tongue and groove uh, behavior. This is the thinnest one that gives you proper tongue and groove behavior. 
and I tend to be a little skeptical about going to four and five inch thick just for economic reasons, although there are situations where that makes sense. So we're going to look at a particular species here. We'll just pick southern pine. I'm picking that to be a little conservative because it's the heaviest material, um, but also where we're located that might be more readily available. So we're going to look at three inch nominal, which you recall is two and three sixteenths inch thick. Uh, in southern pine, we have to assume it weighs at least seven pounds a square foot. So here we've added up all the weights uh, on the decking on the roof. Um, the weight of everything on top of the decking, which includes the, uh, the membrane, the recovery board, and the insulation we said was about four pounds a square foot. From this number, we see that the weight of the decking is seven pounds a square foot. As is typical, we're going to take 20 pounds a square foot for the live load. Uh, so this should have said live load right here. I apologize. So this should have said weight for the decking itself. This is everything on top of the deck decking. And this is the live load on the decking. Uh, I've done my usual thing here of replicating things and then not editing them, but you get the gist. Here we have insulation and whatnot. Here we have the weight of the decking. Here we have the live load, and that all adds up to uh, 31 pounds a square foot. And by the way, there is no load factors. This is a loud strength design. This is the way the decking people have chosen to formulate it. So there is no. This is not the load and resistance factor design, but is a loud strength design. All right, so this is a big, complicated, messy table, but I'll just tell you that across the top here, we have Douglas fir, larch, and southern pine, which for stress capacity and load carrying capacity have been combined together. They're very, very similar, but also the grading agents agencies uh, periodically consolidate, and they choose numbers that will deal with both of these, or maybe the industry is consolidated. So the people who produce Douglas fir, larch, and southern pine uh, all want to kind of toss all those species together and not make a distinction between them, which from the sort of commodity point of view makes a lot of sense. So here we have other species, uh, white pine, white fir, ponderosa pine, etc. We're going to focus though on the southern pine part. And as we mentioned, we're going to be looking at the nominal three inch for the moment. So to make this more readable, I'm going to blow up this portion of the table. And that's that right there. And it looks something like this. And as I mentioned, we're going to ignore that. So we're going to mainly focus on three inch and we're going to focus on this column right here. So let me explain kind of what these, all these columns mean. Uh, simple span, single span, one span. This is the pattern where all the ends of all the decking come to bear on top of the support joist. Uh, and as we mentioned, this tends to deflect more and because of uh, deflection limitations, uh, it carries less. So generally speaking, whatever you see in this set of columns is less than whatever you see over here. And that's why we were going to this uh, continuous mode, uh, the random uh, continuous lengths, I think was the term. Um, so we're going to focus on this. And then there are two deflection criteria, and I find this table really annoying. This, this right here is L. They've chosen a lowercase level L in a sans serif font. So for all the world, it looks like an I or a one which, you know, from a graphic design point of view, is about as dumb as you can do. But think of that as an uppercase L, which is the span of the decking. This is the deflection criterion of L over 180. This is the deflection criterion of L over 240. We're going to assume for the moment a flat roof. So we have to go with this L over 240 to avoid ponding, to assure that we don't have ponding. If we have enough of a slope on the roof that we're absolutely sure we don't have ponding, then we can pick this uh, lower deflection. Generally speaking, most of the designers I know 
will tend to stick with this criterion. It's a little bit more um, rigorous or uh, inhibiting in, in the sense that uh, the design is going to have to be stronger and a bit more expensive. Uh, but generally speaking, it's probably good practice if you like your buildings to look straight and have people really see them as having value, you want to limit some of these deflections. Okay, so we're going to stick with the L over 240 criterion. We're going to stick with continuous. We're going to use nominal 3-inch decking, which leaves us with this portion of the chart surrounded with blue. And what it says is if we use that decking in an 8-foot span, we can support 136 pounds per square foot. Well, our calculated loads for combined dead plus live were 31. So what we're going to do is we're going to scan down here. Here we're going to increasing length. As we increase length, we can handle less load because deflection becomes more and more of a problem. But here we can have 32 pounds per square foot uh, at a span of 13 feet, assuming that we have random lengths continuous and assuming that this is our deflection criterion of L over 240. Um, so we know we can span 13 feet in any roofing application where the snow load doesn't exceed 20 pounds a square foot. We put the live load on the roof at 20 pounds a square foot. In Raleigh, North Carolina, the snow load is only 15 pounds a square foot, but if you wanted to apply this somewhere in the country where the snow loads are greater than 20 pounds a square foot, uh, we'd have to adjust our target number. But our target number is 31. We are getting 32 here, which means we can support more than our target, and the span is 13 feet. So we say um, this 32 pounds a square foot is greater than the total gravity load on the decking of 31 pounds per square foot. So we can span up to 13 feet in any location where the snow load is less than 20 pounds a square foot. 12 feet is probably a more rational modular dimension for most applications. So 12 feet is a really nice number. And what that says is you could go 12 feet or you could go 10 feet with this. Um, whatever module seems to make sense for you. But 12 feet is a really nice spacing because it allows you to give some breathing room to your support structure and it also uh, makes things have a certain clarity and cleanness of look. So you don't end up with huge numbers of spanning members or rafters or beams uh, to sort of clutter the image of the place. And it's very simple construction. You know, every 12 feet, you have uh, a rafter or a beam or whatever, and you then are able to span cleanly between that with the decking. Um, there are some other things that you can do. If you have a sloped roof, you can actually up the loads somewhat because the roof uh, is beginning to act as a diaphragm resisting gravity. We're not going to go into this now, but you should be aware that uh, when you do a sloped roof, uh, your loads can go up, and that's good because you tend to really want sloped roofs in snow country. So that ends our discussion of wood decking from Chapter 6, subsection, excuse me, Section 2, subsection 1.